In late December 2007, life was looking pretty good. I had just wrapped shooting of the pilot of a new TV series, The Beast. My wife Lisa and I were enjoying a second honeymoon of sorts after a long, difficult period in which we had grown painfully apart. And I was feeling excited about new work, new directions, and the promise of the future. So Lisa and I were planning to spend New Year's Eve at our ranch in New Mexico, as we'd done for the past few years. But first, we stopped off in Aspen to visit a couple of friends. And it was there that I got the first hint that something was wrong. I had been having some digestive trouble, mostly acid reflux, and a kind of bloated feeling for a few weeks. I've had a sensitive stomach my whole life, so I hadn't thought much of it, but lately I just couldn't shake the constant discomfort. I wasn't hungry, and I felt sick whenever I did eat, but I'd always been pretty healthy, so I figured the feeling would pass eventually. So in Aspen, we all raised our glasses of champagne for a toast, I took a sip, and as the champagne began to course through my esophagus to my stomach, I nearly choked. It burned like acid going down. It felt like I'd drunk lye. A sharp, searing pain that brought tears to my eyes. I'd never felt anything like it. But not wanting to ruin the festivities, I said nothing to Lisa. I was used to ignoring pain, so I just didn't drink any more champagne that night, and I didn't think anything more about it. Three weeks later, in January 2008, I learned that the burning in my stomach wasn't some minor irritation. It was the result of a blockage in my bile ducts, which was caused by pancreatic cancer. Just about the most deadly, untreatable cancer you can get. When my doctor at Cedar sinai in Los Angeles said the words pancreatic cancer, a single thought popped into my mind. I'm a dead man. That's what I had always thought when I heard someone had pancreatic cancer, and it usually turned out to be true. My doctor told me that my chances of surviving for more than a few months weren't high, and I had no reason to doubt him. Now, a lot of things go through your head when you get a death sentence handed to you. Starting with, why me? What did I do to deserve this? Once the shock wears off, it's hard not to sink into bitterness, to feel that you've been singled out in a way that's not fair. For me, that initial shock quickly turned to self-criticism and blame. Did I do this to myself? What could I have done differently? Is it my fault? In those first few weeks after my diagnosis, amid the whirlwind of figuring out treatments and medication, I struggled with Lisa's help to make sense of what was happening to me. Trying to counteract all the negative emotions that kept welling up, the anger, the bitterness, despair, I began thinking to myself, I've had more lifetimes than 10 people put together and it's been an amazing ride, so this is okay. So I was trying to find some way to accept what was going on. But then a funny thing happened. I just couldn't. I was not ready to go, and I was damned if this disease was going to take me before I was good and ready. So I said to my doctor, show me where the enemy is and I'll fight him. I wanted to understand exactly what I was up against so I could go after this cancer rather than waiting for it to beat me. And in the year and a half since my diagnosis, that's exactly what I've done. With every ounce of energy I have, Fighting cancer has been the most challenging, eye-opening experience I've ever had, and it has sent me on an emotional journey deeper than anything I've ever felt before. Facing your own mortality is the quickest way possible to find out what you're made of. It strips away all the bullshit and exposes every part of you, your strengths, your weaknesses, your sense of self, your soul. It also leads you to confront life's hardest questions. Is there a heaven? Will I make it in? Has this life counted for something other than just my own narcissism? Have I lived a good life? Am I a good person? It's easy to dismiss these difficult questions when you have your whole life ahead of you. But when faced with your own mortality, they suddenly take on a whole new meaning. There's a scene at the end of Saving Private Ryan that really resonated with me when I first saw it. And it does now more than ever. As an old man, Private Ryan muses aloud about whether he's lived a good life. I tried to live my life the best I could, he says. I hope that was enough. It's so hard to judge your own life to know whether you've made a mark in this world. So doing this book was in part a quest to find that out for myself. 
I've never been one to spend a lot of time dwelling on the past, so spending time with Lisa and looking back at our lives has been really illuminating, especially in the light of what our future now holds. It has also been cathartic. I've never felt like I had all the answers, and I certainly don't claim to now. Yet the one thing I realized as Lisa and I retraced the arc of our lives is that no matter what happened, we never, ever gave up on each other, on our dreams. I'm far from perfect, and I've made a lot of mistakes in my life. But that's one thing we both got right. And it's the one thing that is keeping me going today. So as I wrote this in June of 2009, sitting in our beautiful ranch home in New Mexico with the sun beaming down on the mountains, I realized yet again how much more I want to do in this life. Together with Lisa, I'll keep on pushing, I'll keep on believing, because that in the end is the greatest gift we have.